This is Chapter 5, Dimensional Analysis, Part 3. In this video, I'm going to do just a single example of dimensional analysis. The solved problem is Stokes flow over a sphere, which sort of jumps off on something you already know. In lab number one, you learned that at very low velocities, the drag force on a sphere is only a function of the sphere diameter d, the dynamic viscosity mu, and the steady fluid velocity v. So for so-called creeping flow, also called Stokes flow, we get that the drag force is only some unknown function of diameter, free stream velocity, and dynamic viscosity. And so the problem statement is to use dimensional analysis to determine the form of the famous Stokes equation. And below I've written, to save you the trouble of going and looking at lab number one, I've written the result here that Stokes' famous result is that the drag force is 3 pi mu vd, and we're going to try to re reproduce this. So I'm going to use the method of repeating variables, and I'm going to do it in a very formal, sequential fashion. On a test, you're not going to want to take such a formal, detailed approach. You can write the steps down in a, a, a more rapid fashion, but since I'm teaching this, it makes sense to go through it in a very methodical way. So step one is to list the n variables in your problem. And you're given the variables in the problem statement in this case. Uh, you've got one, two, three, four variables. So n is four variables. Don't forget to include the dependent variable, the thing you're after, the drag force. You're given the variables in this problem, so they're all independent. You'll notice that they include geometric effects, the diameter. They include fluid properties, the viscosity, and external effects, the free stream velocity. Now you might wonder why density is not included in the fluid properties. And it, it's because we're dealing with Stokes flow, with creeping flow. Very, very low velocities. The convective acceleration terms are nearly zero. Remember, this is a steady flow, so there's no local acceleration, if you think back to chapter four. So this is the special case as the fluid velocity approaches zero, and you can neglect those nonlinear acceleration terms. So step two is to express the variables in terms of basic dimensions. So this harks back to chapter one. I'm going to use the mass length time scheme. You could use the force length time scheme if you like. So let's just check these. So, so for the drag force, which would be Newton's, now I'm using the mass length time scheme, so that's going to be a kilogram meter per second squared, so that's correct. Diameter, of course, has dimensions of length. Velocity is distance over time, so that's correct. And for dynamic viscosity, the units are kilogram over a meter second, so you can see that that's correct. If you didn't happen to remember that, you can deduce this in a couple of lines by remembering Newton's law of viscosity, and we discussed this in a previous video. So I've repeated each variable with its dimensions at the top of the screen here. So that's our step two completed. Step three now, we want to determine the number of pi parameters. And the number of dimensionless parameters that you get out of a problem is k equals n minus j. k is the number of parameters that you get. n is the number of variables you start with. In this case, we had four. We counted them, right? We got four variables in the problem. One, two, three, four. And we have three basic dimensions, mass, length, and time. So from Buckingham Pi theorem, it says we have four minus three equals one, that we only expect one pi term. And indeed, this is a very unusual case. That's why I selected this problem. When you have one pi term, there's a special way that you handle the last step. And so that's why I wanted to cover this problem in detail. You'll 
Notice that the problems I'm doing are different than those in the textbook. I want to leave the ones in the textbook for you to study and provide you with additional ones in these videos because the more problems you study, the more you'll uh, become comfortable with the technique of dimensional analysis. So moving on, now we ha we've completed step three and we've shown that we only have one pi parameter. We have j equals three, which is the number of basic dimensions. We select j equals three repeating variables from the n equals four variables. And if you remember, one of the rules is that for the repeating variables, we cannot select the independent parameter. So we don't select the thing of interest. So if we can't select this one, then we really only have uh, three variables left. We have no choice in this case. The three repeaters have to be diameter, velocity, and dynamic viscosity. Nevertheless, we should check the rules here. We have to check that all the reference dimensions are included in those three repeaters and you can see that's the case. Indeed, dynamic viscosity has all three just on its own. So that's fine. And you have to check that the repeating variables themselves cannot form a dimensionless product. Now I showed in a previous video a rigorous way of demonstrating that and I will actually do that again in an, in an upcoming video. But in this case, you don't have to use that, that rigorous technique. Uh, you can actually see by inspection, and I've written down a few clues here about how you might go about doing that. If you were to form a dimensionless parameter with d, v, and mu, you couldn't possibly include mu dynamic viscosity because there'd be no way to get rid of this m term, right? It's the only parameter that contains m. So there's no way that a dimensionless parameter made out of those three variables could include dynamic viscosity. You can't do it. So now we just look at the remaining two variables and we run into the same issue. If we try to form a dimensionless parameter with d and v, there's no way to get rid of this uh, time term because time isn't contained in both variables. So we conclude just by inspection here that we satisfy the requirement that you can't form a dimensionless parameter with those three terms. If you have any doubts about doing this, you can set it up in a very rigorous procedure and check the coefficients. And I will do that again in, a, in an upcoming video in case you're not comfortable with the inspection approach. So now I've got my four variables and my three repeaters, which I didn't have any choice of picking, but I've checked that they satisfy the rules for repeating variables. Now I move on to step five and I form my n minus j pi parameters or pi terms. In this case, there's only one. So we set up our three repeating variables here raised to powers a, b, and c. And here's our only one non-repeater in this case, right? So our non-repeating variable comes out front. And then we replace the variable with the dimensions for each variable. Let's, let's just quickly check that. Make sure I didn't make a mistake. So force is mass length over time squared, you know, kilogram meter per second squared, meter. Velocity is uh, length over time for sure. And dynamic viscosity is maths length over time. And I raise those to A, B, C. And ultimately I've got to adjust A, B, and C so that we have no dimensions on the left hand side. We have no dimensions of length, mass, or time. So now we evaluate those exponents that make pi one dimensionless. I think I do that on the next slide. So I just, again, I always do this. I repeated the, the equation, the last equation from the previous slide up here. And what we're going to do now is match exponents on left and right. So matching exponents, let's look, let's look at the exponents for M. And I've done these in a, in a you'll see the, uh, these work in a very nice order. Uh, you could just write down all three equations and then play with them to get the solution. But for this case, I'm doing M first. 
So you can see we have, in this case, we have m to the 1, so the exponent's 1. No m, no m, m to the c, so the exponent's c. And then, of course, the exponent over on this side on m has to be 0. So 1 plus c equals 0. That gives that c equals minus 1. Now we do the same thing for time. And we have, for this term, minus 2. So minus 2 no time here, minus b minus c, right, equals 0. So that's correct. Now we can solve for b, given that we know c. So b equals minus 2 minus c, that's correct. And we make that substitution uh, in for c. And you've got minus 2 plus 1 gives minus 1. That's correct. Now we do our exponents on the dimension L. We can see we have 1 plus A plus B minus C equals 0. We have 1 plus A plus B minus C equals 0. That's correct. Now I've gotten B and C, so I'm going to solve this equation for A. So A equals, let me just check this. Yeah, A is going to equal C minus B minus 1. Yes, that's correct. And I make the substitutions for C equals minus 1 here and b equals minus 1 here, and that's what I've done over here. So minus 1 plus 1, that's going to go away. You just end up with minus 1. Now we do our back substitutions. We're going to substitute minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 here. So you can see that's what I've done. And so we get pi 1 equals the drag force over dv times mu. That's the result. I've just written it again at the top of the slide. Now, finally, step six is to express the result in final form. And the instructions say, in the pi Buckingham theorem, what we do is we set up pi one equals some function of the other pi parameters. Now, in this case, we only have pi one. So there is no pi two, and there is no pi three, etc. And so, if you think about it for a moment, it follows in this case that the, this function on, on, on this side can't be zero. That wouldn't make sense. Otherwise, you'd have nothing. So it makes sense that the right-hand side, the function on the right-hand side is a constant. So when you have one pi term, you set that function, that unknown function, equal to a constant. And I'm going to call it c. And we get that the drag force equals c mu v d, which looks a lot like Stokes's famous result. And it's interesting that the, the constant c here is independent of the fluid type that you do the experiment in, it's independent of the sphere diameter, and it's independent of the fluid velocity, provided you have very, very low velocity flow, so-called creeping flow. We happen to know now that independent of this example, that that's when you have a Reynolds number much, much less than 1. Now, that's as far as dimensional analysis can take you. You can't obtain the constant c from dimensional analysis, but technically you only require a single experiment in a single fluid to get that constant c. Of course, in reality, you'd want to do experiments with a number of cylinders and check that it is a constant. Uh, and you should know from lab number one that, that experiments agree with Stokes's famous result, and you get that this constant c, this constant c is equal to about 9.42. Of course, you'd never know from experiments that it was exactly equal to 3 pi. Now, Stokes solved the Navier-Stokes and continuity equations for so-called creeping flow. He crossed out those convective acceleration terms, arguing that at very low velocities, the acceleration, the convective accelerations of the flow around the sphere are negligible and the viscous terms dominate, and he got an analytical solution that showed that that constant was equal to 3 pi, and that agrees with experimental measurements at low velocities. And that completes this example.